How you living, my chooms? Glad you all could join me today because we got an important subject to cover. So, as you guys know, part of the reason why I created this channel was to dispel some of the misinformation, fear-mongering, and bro science out there, which has caused much confusion in the hair loss community, especially when it comes to safe and clinically effective proven treatments like finasteride. But I can empathize with many people's reservations to start the drug. Hell, I used to have those reservations myself, and there was even a time when I was was firmly in the anti-finasteride camp. It was only through doing research that I came to realize that much of what I feared about what the drug may have been doing to me was just in my head, and that finasteride is indeed a safe and effective treatment. When I create these videos discussing the effectiveness and safety of finasteride, I don't do so with any inherent pro-finasteride bias. Rather, all I want to do is just disseminate the existing research on the drug and present it in a way that is interpretable to my viewers so they can be better educated before making a decision themselves. After digesting the research, if people decide they still aren't convinced about finasteride safety and efficacy, uh, then, you know, that's ultimately up to them. But I nevertheless find that the level of misinformation out there regarding this treatment to be harmful and misleading, as it's usually based on unverifiable anecdotal claims or basic science studies that haven't been replicated in humans yet. So, if you look at discussions online about hair loss, people will often formulate theories based on little or no data at all, just because people present their claims with a degree of such confidence that it makes others take them seriously. You see this with bullshit artists all the time, which is why there are still people out there who take new age shit like homeopathy seriously. Clearly, people do not need strong evidence to be convinced by weak theories, otherwise con artists and charlatans would all be out of the job, which brings us to today's subject. Reflex hyperandrogenicity. Doesn't that just roll off the tongue? So what the hell is this? Well, it's a popular subject on hair loss forums, and even though it is not based on any scientific evidence, people talk enough about it to the point where it is being taken seriously. So before I take any official stance on this hypothesized condition, let's talk about what it is from the perspective of people who promote its existence. So what they, being the people who believe it's real, claim is that there is an upregulation of the androgen receptors due to the use of 5-AR inhibitors like finasteride and dutasteride or other anti-androgens like clascoterone, which is also known as brizula or Winlevy, as well as RU5841. What allegedly happens is that for some unfortunate individuals using finasteride, the decrease in DHT levels from the drug causes an increase in the number of androgen receptors in the cells. It's kind of like a form of homeostasis where the body will try to hypercompensate in response to the deprivation of androgens in the body. This is used to explain why some people apparently have paradoxical side effects from finasteride, which of course, as you guys know, is a drug that is supposed to lower androgens in the body, yet in these people winds up causing a whole slew of androgenic side effects such as acne, increased libido, and yes, even hair loss. And apparently this may continue to happen even upon cessation of use, according to the individual's report at least, and it leaves them in a hyperandrogenic state that can persist for a long period of time, perhaps even indefinitely if you take the word of some of these people on the forums. And you know, this is pretty interesting because this is the polar opposite of what the post-finasteride syndrome foundation usually claims, which is that finasteride somehow causes a hypo natal effect in men that persist indefinitely, even though we've already established that that theory is complete bullshit. Yet it is funny how finasteride can supposedly cause two polar opposite problems in different individuals. So I'm not going to talk about post-finasteride syndrome since I've already created several videos addressing the subject, but I do want to talk about reflex hyperandrogenicity as it's a subject I have not tackled before, at least not in any of my videos. But before we can establish whether or not the claim of its existence is real, we have to look at the theory behind it, namely the pharmacological concept of upregulation of cellular receptors in response to drugs. Now, this is not new, nor is it unique to drugs that affect the endocrine system. A classic example of upregulation is with the drugs known as beta blockers, the classification of drugs known as beta blockers, I should say, which are used to treat high blood pressure as well as heart disease in patients. Beta blockers work by blocking what are called the beta adrenergic receptors on the cells, particularly in the heart, and this causes them to block the effect of adrenaline and the sympathetic nervous system, which controls things like heart rate and vasodilation. So people who are on beta blockers tend to have a slower heart rate. The body reacts to this by creating more beta receptors, which to some degree negate some of the effects of the drug, but the most important effect of this upregulation is that if the drug is stopped abruptly, then the 
the increased number of beta receptors will cause the heart rate to rise more than it should, and it may take several weeks for the number of beta receptors to return to normal, which could put the patient at risk of heart rhythm problems or even a myocardial infarction, which of course is a heart attack. Because of this, doctors will tell patients not to abruptly stop their beta blocker drug. Instead, they will tell their patients to taper it down gradually over time. This upregulation up of the beta receptors occurs more if people are on higher doses of the drug for a longer period of time than if they are on low doses for short periods of time. Another example of these drug-induced changes is in uh, the receptors you see on people addicted to narcotic pain medications like oxycodone, morphine, or even heroin. If people use these drugs chronically, they become less and less effective, so they have to take a higher and higher dose just to get the same effect of the drug. When they go off these drugs, they go into withdrawal, which causes severe emotional and physical agony, which can even result in death depending on the drug as well as the severity of the addiction. The same thing can happen with alcohol when alcoholics stop alcohol abruptly. Alcoholics can go through DTs, which is delirium tremens, where they'll hallucinate, hence which is why the stereotype of them seeing pink elephants is real in the sense they really can hallucinate as a withdrawal symptom. The point of all this, though, is that drugs can cause a response in the body that tends to oppose the effect of the drug due to upregulation or downregulation of different receptors in the cells. So since we've established upregulation is a real thing, does it also happen with finasteride? And if it does happen, is it at all clinically significant to the point where anyone should care? Well, if you look at any hair loss forum, which I don't recommend because 99% of it is bro science bullshit, you will find that the people talking about hyperandrogenicity aren't able to cite any scientific research to back up their claims. The reason for this is that the science that exists on the subject shows that the situation is much more complicated than they make it out to be. The present scientific data on the subject looks at the effect of 5-AR inhibitors on androgenic receptors in the prostate and in the central nervous system, and as we will see, the research is not very consistent in its findings. So. Does the lack of clinical research mean they're wrong? No, but if you look at the existing data, their claims are not only not backed by scientific research, the scientific research actually seems to suggest the opposite of what they claim. So to explain this, let's take a look at some of the studies. The first study looked at the effects of androgens and antiandrogens on the regulation of androgen receptors in the central nervous system of rodents. The androgens they used were testosterone and dihydrotestosterone, and the antiandrogens they used were fluoridyl, which is a direct antiandrogen, and they also used finasteride, which needs no introduction, but it is different from fluoridyl in that it inhibits DHT through the 5-AR pathway rather than working as a direct antiandrogen like fluoridyl. So to conduct this experiment, they used female mice and castrated male mice, so mice with low testosterone levels all across uh, every subject. But anyways, the research then looked at the response to administering testosterone or DHT with or without either fluoridyl or finasteride, and specifically, they looked at the antigen receptor levels in the brain after each intervention. So what they found was that in mice, if you administer testosterone or DHT, the number of antigen receptors actually increases, and if you give anti Antigens, it blocks the effect of the androgen receptors, so the number of androgen receptors do not increase when you give them antiandrogens. This is the opposite of what you would predict if reflex hyperandrogenicity was a real thing. So at least in this study, it appears that the upregulation of androgen receptors doesn't occur acutely, but this study doesn't address prolonged use of antiandrogens, so let's see what other data is available. So in the next study, which is from 2011, we actually do have some human data in patients treated with finasteride for enlarged prostate, which keep in mind is 5 milligrams, which is 5 times the standard dose for androgenic alopecia. In this study, we have 47 patients who are all being treated for benign prostatic hyperplasia, or BPH. All the patients had what is called a transurethral urethral resection, I should say, transurethral resection of the prostate, which is also known as a TURP. And what that is, is a surgery where you have a blockage in your prostate, so they surgically ream it out so you can urinate better. The researchers looked at the prostate tissue they obtained from the surgery, and they were able to determine the number of androgen receptors using immunostaining, which is basically where they have an antibody, which is fluorescent, and it is an antibody 
antibody to the androgen receptors so it sticks to them and they can look at the look at it through a microscope to quantitate how many androgen receptors there are. The researchers themselves know that this is not the most exact tool and there's the results of the study are only approximate. Using this tool, they compared the number of androgen receptors versus how long each patient had been on finasteride, and they found that there were more androgen receptors in patients who were treated longer with finasteride. This suggests that in the prostate, at least, there is upregulation of androgen receptors, and since we know the prostate is influenced by the same 5-AR enzyme that affects the scalp, specifically the type 2 enzyme, then logic would dictate that this same outcome would occur with finasteride use for the treatment of androgenic alopecia. Although, again, it is important to remember that the dosage for hair loss is much smaller than for enlarged prostate. They use 5 milligram finasteride tablets rather than 1 milligram finasteride tablets, and furthermore, many people on finasteride use even less than 1 milligram and still report great success with the drug. So, many people who see this study will think this is the smoking gun that confirms a link between finasteride use and reflex hyperandrogenicity just based on their own intuition knowing that the scalp like the prostate is affected by dht albeit in a different way but this is not the end of the story. There is a more recent study, in fact, from 2014, which looked at androgen receptor levels in the prostate in greater detail than in the 2011 study we just went over. In this study, they again used tissue from patients who had undergone the TURP procedure for treatment of BPH. However, unlike the first study, the patients in this study were selected randomly from the group of TURP patients, and the investigators were blinded as to whether the patients had been on finasteride or not. So this is a better study methodology than the 2011 study. They also used more precise techniques to measure AR receptor levels in the tissue, and looked at two types of prostate tissue instead of just the prostate overall. What what they looked at were epithelial tissue, which is from the lining of the prostate, as well as stromal tissue, which is from the interior of the prostate. So overall, this is a much better study. So anyways, there were 49 patients, all men obviously, as women don't have prostates, well at least most of them do not, and out of those 49 patients, 23 of them received finasteride for an average length of 7 months before their TURP surgery, versus 26 patients who did not take finasteride. So they all had the biopsies done during the surgery and the tissues were examined for angin receptors. The effects of finasteride on the two different parts of the prostate were not quite the same. I'm going to throw up this graph and what you can see here is that instead of upregulating the number of angin receptors in the epithelium, uh, what happened instead is that they decreased significantly with finasteride and also decreased in the stroma as well, although that difference was not statistically significant. The important thing though is that in these patients who were on finasteride long term, there was no evidence of upregulation of the androgen receptors in the prostate due to finasteride. So this study with uh, much better method methodology actually contradicts the earlier study. So if we look at all these studies as a whole, they do show mixed results on the subject overall. So how do we draw a conclusion from all this? Well, here are a few important facts to take from everything we've gone over so far. Number one, Upregulation with 5-AR inhibitors may occur, though the data isn't very strong, and there is no evidence that the effects, if they happen at all, are significant to the extent that it is being proclaimed by proponents of hyperandrogenicity theory. In fact, based on the best prostate data available, upregulation does not occur, and there may even be some downregulation of the androgen receptors. Number two, even if there are changes in the number of androgen receptors due to taking finasteride, be it through upregulation or downregulation, there is absolutely no indication that these effects would persist for any length of time after stopping the drug. Remember, even heroin addicts, once they go through withdrawal, will return to normal, and the same thing occurs with alcoholics too. And about the only thing I would recommend, though, based on this data, is that if you do need to stop finasteride for any reason, it might be better to taper it down uh, over the course of several weeks under your doctor's supervision, rather than just trying to stop it abruptly. In fact, it is likely you won't even have to stop it, as any adverse effects will likely go away with continued use, and failing that, they'll go away with a lower dose. So, very, very small chance you'll have to stop finasteride. More than likely, you can just adjust your dose titration and everything will be fine. So, why do people, despite the lack of any good evidence, think they're being a Afflicted by reflex hyperandrogenicity. Well, since we don't have any evidence, I'll just throw a theory out there, my own theory that is, and that is that the people who think finasteride is making the hair loss worse are people who are just getting a shed. Any hair loss treatment that works can cause a shed. The reason this happens is because an effective hair loss treatment like finasteride will cause the hair follicles to shift from the resting telogen phase into the antigen growth phase, and this results in the loss of the old hair in the beginning of new hair growth. 
And yes, this can happen multiple times, not just once. So even people who have been on finasteride for a while who get a shed down the road may misinterpret this as some sort of upregulation of the androgen receptors and hyperandrogenicity. The reason why they think the results are prolonged is because they'll stop the drug due to the shed and naturally they will lose the benefits of the drug and the shedding will continue as androgenic alopecia gradually causes their hair follicles to self-destruct. Then they'll go on hair loss forums to cry about how finasteride caused reflex hyperandrogenicity and it destroyed their hair and then every impressionable idiot who reads their posts will create their own post about it which eventually leads to this huge culture of fear surrounding this drug just based on weak anecdotes. Also, You'll notice a lot of them complain about other androgenic side effects, like increased acne, but that's not possible because finasteride doesn't affect the type 1 isoenzyme, which is more active in the skin. Now, I know people on dutasteride have also claimed to have reflex hyperandrogenicity, um, but dutasteride suppression of the type 1 isoenzyme is not enough to effectively treat acne to begin with, so the chances of any up or down regulation seems pretty minimal. Plus, I've seen people claim they got increased acne via reflex hyperandrogenicity from just finasteride alone. And, and again, that is not possible as finasteride has no effect on the type 1 isoenzyme, which is active on the skin. So the reason why these people have acne is not because of finasteride. It is just because they get acne and they should go to a dermatologist and get treatment rather than try to blame finasteride. And as for increased libido, this isn't because of reflex hyperandrogenicity. It's because finasteride raises testosterone by an average of 9 to 15%. So for most people, this isn't really enough to matter uh, because, you know, that's a very slight increase in testosterone, but it may be enough for some people to feel maybe just a bit more randy throughout the day. So it's a rare benefit or, you know, maybe a hindrance based on your perspective, but some people do get an increase of libido while on finasteride. For me, my libido wasn't affected. Uh, Dutasteride, when I was on it, like back in 2014, 2015, did raise my libido quite a bit. It was actually pretty annoying, but when I went back to finasteride, my libido bent down to just normal baseline levels. But anyways, the people claiming some sort of uh, hypothetical hyperandrogenicity state uh, occurring on finasteride are basing all their claims on anecdotes, not science. And this can be explained away without invoking this unproven hypothesis of androgen receptor upregulation. There are no studies that prove that any such hyperandrogenetic state occurs with finasteride. Yet these type of anecdotes are weaponized to push an anti-finasteride agenda because people resent the idea of others having having success in treating their hair loss when they themselves have failed. So unless further studies arise supporting this hyperandrogenicity hypothesis, for now, I think we should trust in the existing science, which shows that finasteride is safe and effective in the vast majority of individuals who use it to prevent hair loss. Reflex hyperandrogenicity, like post-finasteride syndrome, is just another form of baseless fear-mongering that distracts from the overwhelming good that finasteride does in treating androgenic alopecia. And it's also curious that we've only started hearing about hyperandrogenicity recently, even though the the drug has been around since 1992, and in that respect, it's kind of similar to post-finasteride syndrome, which only became trendy in the last 10 years or so, but this is probably because litigation against Merck has become profitable only in the last several years. You know, at least that's my hypothesis, and at least I actually try to disseminate research to back up my claims rather than crying when people don't believe me on hair loss forums. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to say about that. Just consider reflex hyperandrogenicity to be in the same category of other scientifically sound subjects like alchemy, flat eartherism, acupuncture, anti-vaccination, and QAnon. Simply put, it's bro science, so ignore it. But on the other hand, don't ignore your hobbies, and that is why I'm going to go back to playing Yakuza 0 again on my PS4 and working on becoming a legend of Kamurocho. All right, take care.